Welcome to the show today. Today I have Victor Galabro with me. He's the founder and CEO of Coupol. And uh, I'm very excited to talk to you today and uh, dive right into your story. So, Victor, tell us a little bit more about who you are. So, who's Victor? And uh, what's the story behind uh, Victor that got us to where we are today? Well, that's a long story. But I mean, maybe try to make it short. Um, basically, my background is in IT and, and process optimization. And that's where I come from. And I spent... Uh, part of my life uh, doing consulting in this field. So some people may say this is a digital consultant or something like this. That's how they call it today. Uh, a few years ago, it's, it was just a consultant. So anyway, um, I, I started in this field, making sure that uh, the companies I worked for uh, could become better, faster, more efficient in, in what they do. Uh, and that's where I first encountered my wish to be an entrepreneur where I felt like, okay, I can bring in a, a lot of change, a, a lot of great ideas. And I felt like a lot of these companies were pushing back on change uh, and I could not stand that. I, I, wanted, I really wanted to move something to, to, to go and, and make it happen. So yeah, that, that was kind of the, the, the first moment um, when I really thought, okay, you need to make something happen on your own and, and, and really change how things work. Yeah, that's, that's where it started and uh, in terms of really making it happen. And over the years, uh, I realized in different fields that there are a lot of things that can be done better. And, and one of them is making sure that the, the right person is with the right skill set is working at the right time at the right place which uh, is, is not happening at the moment. So a, a lot of inefficiency and frustration is in, in recruitment and stuffing overall. So I decided to change how the world works. I love that. Decided to change how the world works. I love that. So, I mean, this, this staffing and recruitment, uh, recruitment uh, uh, thing, is that something that you've been involved in before in, in an industry or is it just like came somewhere else, from somewhere else? No, I strongly believe that to disrupt an industry, you should approach it with from a different angle. So uh, I, I absolutely never had any contact point with the recruitment industry. Obviously, uh, I, I founded an event agency before, so I had employees and all of that. But I think you, you need to think different. And uh, that was always the case when I entered companies as a consultant. I just came into a car manufacturing, banking, insurances, whatever, uh, coming in as a consultant and they expect you to solve problems they have been having for months or years. So you, you cannot think the same way. You, most of the time it's even a burden to have the experience because it, it just narrows down the view so for me it's i think an entrepreneur is somebody that is able to think outside of the box and and if there is no box there are no limits i love that if there's no box there are no limits mm, yeah i like that very interesting viewpoint so um i mean what is it about this staffing industry um that inspired you to get into it. I mean, it's a very specific kind of industry. Um, I've been in it for nine years, so I know I know some of the dysfunctions. <laughs> but um, in general, like, why why did you say this is it? This is the one. This is the one I'm going to go in and change how the world works. Um, I just felt there is a, a real disconnect between what the market needs and and what people need. So both sides of the equation. Had a real problem that is there and, and nobody really solves that problem in, in a good way. So uh, I felt to whoever I'm talking, they feel something needs to be done. Um, so that's that's why I felt this is a, a great area to, to make something happen. On top of that, it's such a massive market. Uh, where, wherever you go in the world, work is, is a really important part of, of everyday's life. So I think the impact you can provide uh, in, in bringing a solution to this field is, is just massive. 
And yeah, as it's not very Swiss uh, in, in this respect, but I, I like to, to really have impact and, and something that it's not just a, a, a new bookkeeping module that will be done somewhere else. It's just really changing things. Why is it not really Swiss? I think uh, Swiss people are more modest. They usually look for how can they provide a good service to the Zurich area or how can they uh, optimize something from 97 to 98.5%. And so just reaching out and trying to be a global leader is, is not uh, an, a Swiss attitude uh, to think bold and to just act in, in a way where you say, okay, we are based in Switzerland, but we want to be a global company. Uh, I think uh, we, we're not really good at it. Uh, okay. So, I mean, you're, you're, you're also Swiss, I'm Swiss. Um, yeah. what, 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 what's the difference? May, is it because you're Italian as well? Or why, why do you think um, you're able or you're, you, you, have, you made that decision? Maybe it's more of a decision. I don't know if it's DNA or a decision. But why do you think um, you are going into that more global leadership role? Um, maybe it's uh, something out of my past. Being a secondo, so being an Italian and growing up in Switzerland, you're somehow not a Swiss. All the people say you're Italian. And, and when you go to Italy, people say you're Swiss. So you somehow are between countries and, and you feel like, okay, I'm, I'm Swiss from, a, from how I grew up and so on, but I still have this Italian DNA. And at the end, I feel like being part of this world. And I say, okay, why look at things in, in borders and, and with, with mentalities of countries, if basically we, we have a world that has the same problems, maybe there are slight changes, uh, maybe this is where it comes from, I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, but there was always a wish to, to look at it from a different angles. So, it's, it's okay. Really okay. Yeah. So I was interested in the why question. I probably asked that a couple of times <laughs> in today's <laughs> conversation. So uh, another thing is, uh, well, once again, going back to the why, um, like you, so you're an entrepreneur um, and you're, you're run, you're, you're leading a very fast growing company. And uh, as an entrepreneur, as we all know, there's not a straight line. There's uh, not much linear about being an entrepreneur. <laughs> so, and uh, you know, every day there's lots of great things and a lot of challenges as well come along the way. What is it that gets you out of bed in the morning and say, okay, I'm just going to face whatever happens today and you know, all the greatness and all the uh, challenges. Like what is that thing that gets you out of bed in the morning? I think once you start a company, it's like your child is born. It's, you will have difficult times. You'll have great moments when, when this little creature is smiling at you and you'll forget all the pain. I think it's somehow similar uh, where, where you just see things happening. And, and Sometimes it's, it's, it's really hard and then you get up in the morning and you know all these issues and, and uh, things come up. And then you suddenly sit in your office and you look around and you see computers being there and you maybe read a review from a user and, and you feel like, wow, we just made a difference. And, and this is where you just forget all the pain. Uh, yeah. I think that's that's where it comes from, and the, the wish to to just really achieve something and, and to see it as a, as a vision is kind of driving. So I don't think that the, uh, an entrepreneur is driven by money or by short term success. It's you you see something in your mind when you start, and the more you work on it, the more it becomes clear on how it could look like. Uh, and you know exactly that you need to take one step after the other. And sometimes you, you may lose track and you need to get back on track to make it happen. Uh, so as long as you feel you're moving towards your target, 
just falling is part of the experience. You need to get up and walk again. Absolutely, absolutely. That's a that's a big that's a big part of success. Getting up again. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> so definitely. I mean, let's talk about that thing that you see. You know, you talked about the vision and talked about um, that drive, that you know, bigger picture. So, what is it? What is it that you see as a bigger picture? You know, long term in 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 this specific area that you're that you're working in. Like, what is it that ch- what is that change that you want to make happen? I think it's not just me that, that wants to make things happen. Things are just changing um, with me or us or without. Um, so the the way how work is performed is drastically changing already now, not in the future now. Um, and, and I think most of the companies and, and workers, I think more of the companies have not really realized what is happening. So technology is changing a lot, not only in terms of uh, specific jobs not being the same anymore or new jobs coming up, but as well, the the way people want to work is changing. Uh, And and I think there are two main categories of of employees out there. There are the ones who who see work as a central element and, and part of their life. And so work is the center and and life somehow fits around work. They live whenever they don't work. And there is another category which sees life as the biggest priority, and and so the job needs to fit around their life needs. And I think we we have built up a lot of models and, and an ecosystem around people that see work as a centric point in their life. And, and we have kind of left by side all the others and say, these are crazy people that don't belong into society. And I think this part of, uh, of the equation is, is starting to grow massively. People see themselves, at least for a portion of their life, uh, have other priorities. And with the sharing economy, they are as well able to do that because they don't have to buy a house, they don't have to buy a car. So there are a lot of things that um, does not need them to have a huge amount of money. So they can live more on the go and, and live life however they want to live life. So uh, the, the model of having the freedom to choose whatever you want to do in a specific moment is, is becoming more and more popular. And, and we want to provide a solution to, to these kind of people that want to live such a lifestyle and we want, don't want to have them penalized by society, by, by insurances that uncover what they should do, by giving them a hard time to, to go and, and perform what they want to do. So we want to make sure that they have an ecosystem where they can easily live such a life. And on the other side, we have companies that pretty much need this kind of people to to cover their peaks and troughs. So I'm curious about this. I mean, is this, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's those sort of like two groups that you described, right? And uh, you know, those, those crazy ones on the one side, you know, those digital nomads, the world travelers, the here and there workers and things like that. You know, I got a friend who's traveling for six months to South America and he comes back for three months, works as a fitness instructor in order to go, you know, to, to Asia after that. And it's just, that's, that's his life. And, um, you know, and, and, and for a long time, it's just been like, oh, these crazy people, you know, one day they'll wake up and, you know, to real life and then, you know, you have to get a job and things like that. So do you think it's, uh, it's, it's you know, this, this still small group compared to the, you know, big group, um, uh, do you think it, this is this static more or less? It's it's the same, or do you think this is it is massively growing as well at the same time on both sides on the people that live that kind of life, but also on the company side of, of companies having models? Do you think it's like it's it's a nice here and there solution, or do you think it's gonna um, or it's already changing in a, in a different direction? Well, first of all, I think. Um, the, the people I was talking about who have life in, in the center of what they do is not just the crazy ones. So every mother at home, um, people between two jobs, uh, retired um, 
uh, people at home, uh, you have students, so there, there, is, there are many different reasons why you have your life in the center and, and the job around there. And I pretty much think that everybody out there sooner or later will become part of this group. So that once you're retired, you may not want to work full time, but sometimes just doing a few days here, it's, it's more about fun and being part of society than about earning money. So I think this is a model that sooner or later everybody will be working in, maybe as a student, maybe between, maybe later, but maybe there will be different stages in your life where this is a good thing. So let's imagine I become that, I want to reduce my full-time work to 60%, but sometimes you, know, uh, you want to buy a new car, you do a few weeks extra on top of that. So you're already in a, in a kind of two-sided model where you have part of your life being structured and have security and, and the job in the center and others where you can just pull in how much work you need uh, depending on your needs. So it's not just the crazy ones or the consultants or the gig economy. So some of, of the people say, uh, I, I just want to be flexible. I, I don't want a fixed place, so I want to work in St. Moritz in winter, and in summer I want to be in, in Ascona, wherever you, you, you want to be. So this could become a lifestyle, obviously. That's, that's what I see. So I don't think it's, it's a small portion, so it's quite big. Uh, I think we never really gave enough attention to this need and requirement. Uh, and I think that companies will will need this kind of target group to address their needs for flexibility. Uh, and it's it's just discriminating to try to flexibilize people that don't want to be flexible, but it's discriminating as well to try to put people that want to be flexible in the rigid format. So I, I strongly believe this model and this attitude will will grow uh, on both sides. I, I I love the way you look at the, you know those those both sides and say you know there's there's those who want to be flexible so to say but they're not allowed to and the other ones that are the other side and it's sort of like there's a huge disconnect there already. Also on that topic when it comes to people's mindsets. Um, or readiness for something like that because it's a massively different way of looking at how we work I mean go to our grandparents and tell them about that. They go like what right? I mean, so let's talk about readiness for this um, Do you think it's just a young generation that goes like yes? That's the only way I can live anyway Or is this something that um, every generation is slowly but steadily embracing or do you think there's a huge uh, gap in between? Well, I think uh, employees or workers or how, however we want to look at it, uh, they're ready. They have always been ready uh, to just look for jobs for specific needs. If you think about um, maybe your grandmother being at home and, and maybe needing some more cash, she would have been open to do some small jobs to, to bring in more money for the family. Um, but it was quite hard. You either had a network where you somehow got the jobs or you don't, and then there, there was no way for you to work. So, um, I don't know, the, 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 your grandfather had to work harder because you needed the money. So I think the, the need and the wish to do that on, on the worker side was always there. There was no solution. I think where we... we are not yet there is more on the company side where the thinking is I need a full-time employee to perform everything. Uh, the reason for that is that companies are not structured enough to be able to outsource specific tasks. So to just give you an example, if you have a, somebody sitting in an office, they usually perform I don't know, 100, 200 different tasks. And you don't know exactly which one will come when, and it's not very well documented, so it's hard to outsource to a specific task. But if you would go and, and say, okay, uh, I'm going to document and make sure that a specific task is well prepared, 
you can easily outsource that and bring somebody in for a day or two. Um, so you, first of all, you, you're able to flexibilize this specific task. On top of that, you're able as well to distribute work across different people. So as long as we have people um, being in burnout and at the same time, we have others that wish they would have a job, there is something wrong in the distribution. And it's not that I can only perform everything and others cannot. It's about how do I distribute it and I need to make it more granular to be able to distribute. And that's one of the big issues in, in today's companies is that they don't really understand the, the tasks and, and they cannot just make them more granular to be able to outsource it at any time. Okay, I, I, I understand that and uh, I very much agree in terms of the structure and the process and, 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 and uh, you know, the, those, those, those tasks basically and the short-term work. Um, one, one thing about like the model itself, I mean, is this a bit like crowdsourcing or is this totally something different? Um, I think uh, crowdsourcing is a possible approach and in crowdsourcing you basically um, throw your, your task into the crowd and somehow it will be done. Uh, Here it's kind of different. You, you have a task and you want to select a specific person out of this group of people. And uh, so you need to specifically address uh, skill sets and, and stuff like that. And then there will be one specific person or a group of, 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 uh, of workers that will perform that task. It could be something done on site. So uh, a lot of the work we do is, is really on site or it could be done um, somewhere in the world. So in any virtual approach, uh, I don't think this is really crucial. Maybe the tools change and then there are different approaches, but at the end it's, it's a, it's one-to-one -one relation rather than one-to-many. So it uh, brings me to the topic of management. So I got, you know, uh, I got a team of 15, 20 full-time employees you know, I got their full attention and, uh, and, you know, things are flowing. They come into the office every day. I see them, you know, a, a coffee, I can have an exchange like that. And, uh, now let's say I have part of this, uh, which is more gig economy, um, um, related. So I would have maybe another 20 or 30 people somewhere here and there do certain things. I mean, first thing I'm thinking is management nightmare. So, um, what, what, what's your experience with that? Like, like, because, uh, like my, my, my sense goes like, okay, so there's, first of all, there's tons of more people being managed for specific short-term things that I can't, uh, plan long-term and, uh, you know, what if they don't show up or what, if, you know, what if that, what if this, what's your experience with that? Well, I definitely think that uh, leading uh, a mixed group of people is uh, is more challenging than just going for the for the usual approach. If you, if you think in a usual store, you have 20 people, they always come from Monday to Friday, so th there is no planning involved. You just they just come and, and stay. Uh, the problem about that is that easy planning means inefficiency. So if you can afford to be inefficient, right? Uh, but a lot of companies cannot afford that anymore. So if we look at retail um, in Switzerland, for instance, but everywhere around the world, things are changing. They are changing quite rapidly. So your competition is not around the corner. They may sit in the internet somewhere in China or in the US or in India or wherever in the world, and they don't have the same cost structure. So you're competing um, with completely different settings uh, that you never had before. So you need to make sure that the efficiency of what you're doing on site is, is growing. And the more efficient you want to become, so it's like optimizing the last 20%, it's going to be a challenging thing. So that's why we, we build up the tools and the services to make sure that you can become more efficient and where, where IT and all these services support you to do that. As, as you say, leading a, a flexible 
or what we call a fluid workforce is is quite challenging if you don't have the right tools absolutely so this is a lot more about resourcefulness um and about um um basically efficiencies in in a, in a certain organizational structure being uh you know certain strategy and and outcomes and goals and areas and things like that and then basically making sure that the that whatever resource you put into these operations um, is a lot more resourceful than what it is today. So it's really about the resourcefulness. Uh, absolutely, and, and I really think that it's it's a complete shift in uh, in people's strategy. Uh, it, it becomes more, as I said before, this this fluid workforce, or we we call it just in time stuffing or on demand stuffing. This is kind of a new way to organize your workforce uh, around your business. And as your business is changing, it's becoming more dynamic, quicker. You, you, you just really have ups and downs, not only seasonal, but just really daily ups and downs. You need to change your strategy on how you allocate resources to your business. It's, it's not the same thing. While a few years ago, you have people staying seven or 10 years in your company. Today, maybe it's a two-year turnaround. So there, things are changing. Or, or while um, your customers were ordering three months before, now they're just ordering two days before. So you need to adapt to, to your output uh, and, and to your basically the output you're generating. And, and you cannot um, just have the same strategy while your business completely changed. So it's like running uh, with stone shoes if, if you don't change that. Now this is, um, I, you know, this is, uh, there's so many interesting models these days as well about working and, you know, like holacracy is a big one, right? That's like, especially also used in startups and smaller organizations, which is also a, to a topic that I have there. Like, does this only work for small companies or does it also work for the big boys? No, absolutely. We have the, a, a lot of the companies uh, we already work with uh, are, are large organizations. And I don't think it's, it's large or small. But the question is more on what kind of business or what kind of tasks do you have and, and, and how do you organize yourself? So if we look at giants like uh, Migros or Coke they they could easily implement something like that but easily they need to change the organization the, the way they work but it could be a, a small restaurant around the corner which we are, are as well have like a, a small restaurant in the mountains which is pretty much tied to weather conditions so how could they possibly uh, organize their workforce around the monthly planning it's not possible they can only decide two or three days before uh, what kind of workforce they need for the day. Because if the weather is good, they just need 20 times more stuff than if the weather is not. So it becomes more and more an, an, uh, an on-demand management of workforce. And, and you need to have the right mix of, of permanent stuff and flexible stuff to, to make your business work. And it also sounds like um, the roles are no longer as specific as they used to be. You know, they used to be stakeholder groups. You're a customer. You are working at the company, so you're an employee. You are this. You are that. And now it seems like, especially in this transformation, it's a much, much more mixed setting. So today you're a customer. Tomorrow you're also an employee, maybe for two days. And uh, it's much, much. There's, uh, there's, uh, there's much, much more um, overlay there. No, absolutely. Well, we already have some of this experience today where we have um, workers, we, we call them couplers, um, maybe sitting in a coffee and getting a job in the same coffee uh, for an hour later. So, okay, I just drink one more coffee and then I, I just do the job <laughs> and I pay for the coffees. <laughs> it's like, you know, why not? Why not? Uh, if you have a three hour break, why not just earn some money on the way? I mean, to, to me, what it sounds, it's like it's a much more sustainable way of working because it's not like this massive one process of, you know, um, buyers and sellers, so to say, of work. But it's more like because people are changing their buyers and sellers, like buyers and sellers, because I could 
I could um, use a job tomorrow for a day, but then maybe three days later, I could offer one for a specific thing. So there's, it seems like there's a much more um, mixed up, uh, the groups are much more, more mixed up, but it's also um, more sustainable because it's a bit like software development. Instead of working you know, on a three-year project and then after three years saying, let's look at what we've done, it's more working in sprints. And it feels like it's a little bit like, it's more agile as, a, as an economy. The economy is more agile. Uh, definitely. And I think, the, as I said before, the distribution will become much, much better. If you just think about when you move an apartment from Zurich to Bern, so you have like this four or five people uh, in, your, uh, in your flat in Zurich just bringing everything together in the truck, and then they drive from Zurich to Bern and just say, what's the point? Why do I need five people to, to travel from Zurich to Bern. Bern, you could have four very fresh, nice guys just doing the job there. So I think this different mindset, and as you say, I can be a, a worker today and an employer tomorrow, why not? Uh, practically a lot of, of people in Switzerland are employers as well with uh, a cleaning um, relationship or maybe gardening or they need a painter, whatever, or a consultant, they, they, a teacher. You, you have both sides. And I think what is not really happening today is like all these processes and, and, and everything around this is, is kind of preventing you from doing that. Because if it would be very easy to bring in somebody that could work as a freelancer, why not? Why do I need a consulting firm? Why, why, why do I need uh, a cleaning company? I could make sure that uh, my cleaning lady earns like 50% more and I'm still better off rather than supporting organizations. So I think this could be the rise of virtual organization or uh, freelancers that somehow organize themselves with friends to, to build up teams and to share things. It could be a quite interesting development. It is a very, very interesting vision. And it's not only that, but it's also, you've been, uh, you've been very heavily uh, developing and expanding and growing this. So um, I just uh, like one last question before we finish up. Uh, going back to sort of like your theme of, of your life, um, is there, like when you look back, is there a common thread in your life that, you could express in a tagline or something like that that's a, that would say, oh, this, this is Victor. This is sort of like life philosophy or, or tagline or something. Is there something like that? Well, I think uh, sometimes I feel like focus could be something I, sh I should <laughs> look at more. Um, I, I see myself as somebody that has a lot of ideas and, and wants to move very quickly. And um, yeah, you sometimes forget that execution needs some time and, and you need to make things happen. Um, so I sometimes need to just have the vision, but have people around me that can translate that in very specific steps. Um, maybe I'm sometimes just too, too, too quick to be somewhere. And, and I forgot that I forget that there are a lot of steps between. Sounds like so patience. I, <laughs> sounds like, <laughs> sounds like patience is a big one. Patience for yourself and patience for others. Because we entrepreneurs can sometimes be so impatient with, you know, oh, you know, this needs to happen now, and why is it not working? Why is it not happening? <laughs> yeah, and uh, and you know, you, you you get back to the point, and if you are as well um, operationally responsible, you figure out that maybe your ideas were not clear enough or maybe you, you didn't um, empower your team to, to just make it happen. So you feel like, hey, why, why are you not just doing it? And, and then you realize, well, it's me. I didn't select the right people or I didn't formulate it in the right way or I didn't give them the tools to make it happen. Um, so that was a a good learning on my side to, to just realize it's, it's not moving quick enough. So 
it's not the others doing something wrong. It, it may be me having set it up in the wrong way. Very interesting lesson learned. I think we all learned that lesson along the way. Some, some, sometime we always learn it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you so much, Victor, for being on the show. Really appreciate you sharing your uh, insights, your wisdom, your vision for that, and your insights into that specific area. So thank you so much for being on the show.